Baptist church, they walk out of here, they know what they believe and why they believe it. And that why, if, it's, if we're honest, that why may not be the kind of why we want. For many people, they know what they believe, and the reason they believe it is because they were told to believe it in a catechism book or in a Sunday school class or some preacher. So if, if you want to know why do I believe what I believe, I want you to pay attention every Sunday morning and come back Sunday night and learn all over again. And we're coming from a different point of view. It'll be, I guarantee you, my goal is that it becomes simple and it becomes evident why I believe what I believe. Now, we've already talked about, uh, in, in, in the first few weeks this year, we've talked about this. I believe in the existence of God. Now, I, don't, I can't say that for anyone else. I'm not going to say that our entire church believes that. I don't know. I can just say that our entire church professes to believe that. And I am making this profession right now. I believe there's a God. And we went through why I believe that there is a God. And I believe that fact is a fact. I, I, don't, I don't take this idea that some people have faith and some have fact and we have faith. No, 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 no. We, we looked at the fact, the fact that what you take as fact is almost always based more on faith than on any sight. That's just the nature of it. Now, you just heard Brother Phillips tell us he's about to fly. You're going to Australia, brother. I've never been there. I've never seen it. People have claimed that they've shown me pictures of it. I guess. No, I don't guess. I know. I've seen, I have seen Australia and I've never been there. How do I know that? Because it told me. And I believe it. Now, that's fact. He did not buy that ticket thinking maybe there's an Australia. He, he believes it. Now, he has a daughter who claims to live in Australia right now. He's never said it in those terms. He's never said, well, my, my daughter, she says she lives in Australia. He's never done that to me. He said, he said to me, she lives in Australia. He's never been there. He doesn't know that. No, he does know that. It's based on faith, though, right? I know there's a God. It's fact. The evidence that there is a God is more concrete and apparent than that there is in Australia. That's not all I believe. I believe that this is God's word. This book, the one I'm holding in my hands right now, that this is almighty God. The creator gave me this book and it is his words. I believe that. We looked at why. Now, if this is God's word, then that means that he created everything in six days because that's what this book tells me. And what's interesting is that if you begin to have an objective view of science, science only verifies the word of God. Genuine science only verifies that. I said, come on, preacher. I'll tell you, in this church, our eight-year-olds know that. And they can probably tell you some really good reasons why. Amen? Is that true? Are we, are we learning that? Susie, are you getting that? Are you learning some science? Don't you love science? Science is awesome when it's taught well. What? What is that? Oh, no. Then we looked at this. The God that is, is a righteous God. Righteous. God is righteous. And his laws are righteous. And then we looked at the fact that man has sinned. We looked at what sin is and looked at the sinfulness of man. And because of that sin, last week we looked at the judgment on sin, both now and through eternity. If you live in sin, you are going to pay for that sin now. But it doesn't end when you breathe your last breath. You will stand before God in judgment. And you, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, will pay for that in what the place the Bible calls the lake of fire. And that's where we find ourselves right now. Would you take your Bible this morning and turn to the book of Mark chapter 3, please? Mark chapter number 3. I want to do this right now. I want you to imagine with me back uh, into Bible times. Okay, we're going to take a, a kind of a first eye view of it. We're going to just look at it fresh. 
Mark is in New Testament, chapter 3. So we're looking, now, now, now if you know the book of Mark, it has 16 chapters in it. So chapter 3 would be kind of the beginning. And what Mark is doing is it's giving us the life of Jesus. And it's looking at it from the perspective of the servant and uh, a servant of man. And so he c- goes into how Jesus uh, did so many miracles. And, and it's, a, it's a great book, Mark. It's full of action from the beginning to the end. It's great. I love Mark. But in the book of Mark, I want you to, to, to go with me there. Once you get there, if, when you get there, shout amen. Hey, we got a lot of people there. I like that. That's good. Okay, Mark, Mark, chapter three. Okay, now hold there for a minute. And I want to tell you something about the life of Christ. The life of Christ is given to us in the Bible in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if you look at those books, uh, the, the, the vast majority of all four of the gospels is, are concerning a period in the life of Christ that was only three and a half years long. Jesus was crucified when he was about 33 and a half years old. And what we have in the Gospels is almost entirely accounts of what he said and did throughout the last three and a half years of his time on this earth to the time he died on the cross, resurrected from the dead, and then ascended up to heaven. And then the Gospels each come to an end. So what was happening then before those three and a half years that he goes into great detail about what happens in those, in those, those, those first 30 years of God's life? What was, what was happening when Jesus was here? What was he doing? And, and I, I want you to think about what we know about it. We don't know very much. We know about his infancy. We know about the first few hours of his life. And then in the next few days of his life, we know about where he was born. He was born in what city? Bethlehem, that's right. And then from Bethlehem, the, 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 the angel came and in the dream warned Joseph to take Mary and the baby Jesus to another place. What place was it? Who can tell me? Egypt. And how long were they there? Two years. They were there for two years. So after two years, he comes back. And uh, so when they, when they move back, they move back to the city of? No. Nazareth. There it is. They move back to Nazareth. So they're in Nazareth and that's where he grows up. Okay, so the next time we see Jesus, he's not five. We don't know where he went to kindergarten. Yeah, he wasn't 10. We don't know when he became double digits. We don't know where he was at. But we do know where he was when he was 12 years old, at least for a couple days. And he was, now we can use the word, okay, ready, Moy? Where was he? That's right. He was in Jerusalem. He's 12 years old. And he was at that temple. And now at, the Bible gives us this little window so that we would know that there was already something special about him, even at the age of 12. So at 12, he, he, his parents take him to Jerusalem. And in spite of the fact that we're about to see something very special about this young man, what's interesting about that story is that his mom and dad, or we would call dad as far as Joseph, I'll use that, that vernacular for today. We understand that, that, that Joseph had nothing to do with the birth of Christ, but he was put on the scene so that Jesus would have a dad. And you need a dad. If you don't have a dad, you can make it, but it's a lot harder. You need a daddy. So you have Joseph there, and when they get to Jerusalem, it's interesting how they do not see Jesus as all that much different from the ordinary child because they're surprised how the whole thing transpired. So so Ian, listen, listen about it. So so what happens, Jesus goes to the temple and they worship there. And while they're on their way home, his parents suppose that he is somewhere with his friends. That's where they think he's at. And now, I think that's an important, I want you to hold on to that. When they go over to, to try to find him, they go to the different families where there's other young men and they say about, is Jesus with you guys? Nope. Is Jesus with your son? Nope. Is Jesus playing? Now, that's important. You know what that means? Jesus wasn't that much different than me. I loved when I was a kid playing with my friends. I tell you, I loved going to church. In fact, I wanted my parents to fellowship. Fellowship, mom and dad, fellowship. I've got a lot of playing to do. Once I get home, my, my friends are not there anymore. I need to have fellowship, mom and dad. So you guys talk to your friends for hours. I'm going to go play with my friends. And we're going to uh, have vent, vent all sorts of games. And uh, uh, if you notice, as a pastor, I'm sort of very uh, uh, tolerant of our kids having a good time in our church. Because I was a kid in church too. And I can tell you, some of the best times of my week was playing with my friends at church. And so we don't want them out of control. We can't be screaming in here. But if you see kids uh, doing hide and go seek a little bit, I, we'll, we can tolerate it, right? Amen? 
Okay, good. We want our kids to have a good time. Well, Jesus, his parents thought he was out playing with his friends. After looking and looking and looking and looking, they had gone all day just thinking that Jesus, typical 12-year-old, was with his friends. Keep that in mind for a few minutes. Then, when they finally realize he's not here, they head back to Jerusalem, now very worried, and they are looking all over for him. And as they look and 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 look for a couple days, they finally discover Jesus, and he's at the temple of all places. Now, the temple playground was not a thing. You know what he was doing? He was sitting at the feet of the doctors and the lawyers. And he was, what I think is fascinating, was that he was amazing them. And you know how he amazed them? Not by telling them things. He was 12. They were 50 and 60 and 70 and 80. He was 12. You know what a 12-year-old is not supposed to do? It's not supposed to sit old people down and say, let me tell you how it is. And Jesus didn't do that either. You know what he did? Ian, you know what he did? Jesus asked them questions. And it was his questions that amazed them. It was his questions. His parents finally, when they find him, they're like, what's this? And you know what Jesus said to them? Didn't you guys think I wouldn't be about my father's business? And the Bible says at that moment that, his, that, they, that they just marveled and they kept these things like, wow, this is a different young man. But then the Bible tells us this. It says that he went home with them and was subject unto them. That is amazing. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed this because I don't know uh, if you, someday this is going to happen to you. You're going to figure out that you're smarter than your mom and dad. Not all the time, but most of the time. I mean, usually my mom and dad agree with me because they're smart, you know? But whenever they disagree with me, it's usually because they're dumb, okay? I've got things figured out. Do you realize that Jesus was smarter than me? In fact, do you realize that every single time that his parents had a different idea than his, his was a better idea? Do you know what being subject unto them means? Being subject unto them means when his idea differed from their idea, he still went by their idea. I think it's time for you to go to bed. I'm not tired at all. I have power to stay awake forever. But you say it's time to go to bed? No argument. I'll be submitted. That's the way Jesus was. But from the age of 12 on, we don't know much more about his habits, about his life about his hobbies. We don't know much. There are little tiny clues. And I want you to see a couple of these today. And let me tell you the first clue. The first clue is this. Jesus had friends. He had friends. Means, uh, you'll see that in a minute. I'll show it to you. Okay, Jesus had friends. Now, what you're about to see is this about Jesus, is that those friends that he had, he had friends. Do you realize he had friends? How many friends did he have? How many buddies did he have? I don't know. Three, five, eight, 10, 12, 20? I don't know. But he had friends. You'll see him in a minute. I want you to know, to know this, that when Jesus was with those friends, they did not pick up. Listen up, listen, Brandon, listen up. They did not pick up on the idea that Jesus was somehow all-powerful. Do you realize when the, they kicked the ball over the fence, Jesus had the power to Levitate that ball, and bring it back over the fence. But he didn't do it. Do you realize that when he was playing basketball with his buddy and his buddy sprained his ankle, that his 15-year-old friend Jesus could have knelt down and said, here, here you go, come here, come here. Okay, go home. He could have healed it in a second. He didn't do that. Man, it'd be nice to have a friend like that, huh? <laughs> yeah. Man, I wish I had a little pocket change. Reach in your pocket. Well, there it is again. Man. Be a good friend to have, but Jesus didn't use that. And then one day, one of his friends was talking to another friend, and his friend said, you hear about Jesus? What about him? So somebody was saying he's been preaching. Preaching? Him? Now, I'll show you in a moment. That was not what they expected him to do, which means this. When he was, when he was 14, he wasn't preachy. Now, I'm okay with preaching this, by the way. Don't be preaching to me. In other words, don't tell me the truth. That's what people actually mean by that. 
You know, as soon as you tell someone the truth, they're like, stop preaching at me. I don't want to know what's true. But Jesus wasn't preaching, though. I'll show you in a minute. The people, when he preached as a 30-year-old, the people that had been with him since he was 12 were like, isn't this Joseph's son? That's how they were. So then I want to ask you this morning this. What must it have been like for those friends when they heard that their buddy was now healing people, attracting crowds, preaching. That in Jesus had found a bunch of disciples and these 12 guys, he had picked them, were now going with them everywhere. Wow, I wonder what that was like. You want to see? How would you have reacted? Now, <clears throat> don't have to do that because none of us are good enough like Jesus was. But imagine one of your friends, someone who came to our church, who was in junior church, now, you may not have picked up on it, but he never talked during the service. He was always good. He never told a lie. He never uh, was mean. He never made fun of people. And you may not have picked up on it, but he was that kind of a kid. But he was also kind of just like all the other kids, though. What would happen if you found out that after you went to college and you got married and started your little family, and a couple of years after you're still in the church, amen, still going to church, amen, still going to church every single Sunday, amen, every single Wednesday, you're in church. By that point, you're the central teachers. By that point, you're the ones working hard in the church, amen. And then you hear about that, that friend of yours who's down in San Francisco preaching. He's got like a bunch of people that meet with him in the park. And he's saying he's God. What would your reaction be? Let's see what their reaction, reaction. You want to see? I'll show you. Mark chapter 3, verse number 20. We'll start there this morning. Verse number 20. And the multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. Every time they tried to sit down and eat, there was a press of people asking questions, needing this, they didn't have time to even eat. Verse 21. And when his friends heard of it, whose friends? Jesus' friends. He had friends. And these friends heard about it. These were friends who were friends before the disciples became his disciples. These are friends. And now they're hearing about all this stuff. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3 stuff. Now we're in chapter 3, and these friends hear about it. And let me tell you about these friends. These are good friends. They travel down to San Francisco, to that big park, where he's got this big... And they're going to try to do... Now, here's what we call it today. We use this word. They try to do an intervention. Why? Here's what they think. Verse 21. And when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him. What does that mean? They were literally, sorry, boy, I'm going to use you. Is that okay? They're literally going to say, come here, come here, come here. Okay. And, and Brandon, help me grab his arm. Grab his arm. Take, let's take him over here. He's, he's, this guy's beside him. Grab his arm. I mean, he's not going to go. There you go. Lay hold on him. Hey, 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 Moy, Moy. You're just Moy. Okay? You're just Moy. All right? Yeah, you're, you're not, you got it? Okay, we're worried about you, bud. Aren't you worried about him? Brand, you, I am, <laughs> Brandon, we were about this guy. My goodness. And, and, and Moy, Moy, you got to help me out, man, because uh, just go home and get some rest. Okay, we're taking you back to Nazareth. Really? Yeah, you need to get some rest. Okay, really? take this boy and sit him down. Why would they do that? You know what it says? Because they said, look at the next words, he is where? Don't you love that expression in English? He's beside himself. Have you ever thought about what that's actually like? Isn't that a weird, weird thought? He was beside himself. Girls, think about being beside yourself. Here I am right now, and I'm, well, that's impossible. You can't just, I'm beside, no, I'm not. <laughs> what, does it mean, what does it mean to be beside yourself? What does that mean? Crazy. You know what they said? He was crazy. Now, Amelia, would you think that about your friend if that's what's happening to you? You would, huh? You would. You're normal. You're normal. And that's exactly what his friends thought. His friends thought that way. Question, why do you think I think their friend actually was the son of God? A couple of verses later, you're going to see his mom and dad. I should say his mom and brethren. His dad's probably, uh, Joseph's already passed away. They come and attempt their own intervention. 
Look with me at verse 31. There came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Hey, Jesus, your, your mom and brethren, they're, they're out there looking for you. Verse 33, and he answered and said unto them, Who is my mother and my brethren? And he looked round about on them which sat about him and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and mother. The Bible in another passage tells us that he in his hometown did not do mighty works because they did not believe. So here's what you have then. You have a situation where his own mother comes to, said, uh, people said, you know, your son is saying these, 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 uh, uh, I'll take care of it. Um, uh, uh, James, John, let's, 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 let's go. Joseph, come on, we're going to, okay. Can you please tell him we're here? We need to talk to him. What were they going to tell him? You need to come home with us. Um, are, you, are you feeling okay? I think you're, you've really worked yourself too hard. What am I going to say? Whatever it is, you know what Jesus says? Jesus says, this right here, my mother and my brethren. Now, it doesn't mean he doesn't care about his mom, does it? In fact, the last thing he's going to do on that cross, he's going to say, John, take care of mom. He's going to make sure somebody takes care of his mama. That's important. Amen. But when he began his ministry, to the people who knew him for the first 30 years, he was a normal person. But I'm telling you, I think he was God. Turn with me to Luke chapter 4, would you? One book to the right, just one more book, chapter 4. Here we have a little clue as to how Jesus used his time from the age of 12 to the age of 30. We're going to get another little clue into how Jesus spent his time. In verse number 16, it says this. I mean, Luke chapter 4 should be real close. When you get there, say amen. Good. Look at verse 16. And he, that's Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. Now, the next, the next phrase is really important. And as his, what's the next word? Custom. As his custom. That means his habit. That means what he did all the time. As his custom was. So we're about to see one thing that we know Jesus did habitually. Here it is. Here's what he did habitually. Here it is. Look at it. As his custom was, he went into the, that's a hard word. What is that word? Oh yeah, that's it. Synagogue. That's right. On the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. His habit was to go where? We would call that church. He went to church. That's important. And he went every Sabbath day, every seven days, church. And then the seven days, church. And seven days, later, church. Let me ask you this. Where are you going to be in seven days? Oh, praise the Lord. Good. Brother Dean's going to be here. I don't miss it. Because Jesus would have been in church. But you know what's going to happen here? Jesus is going to do something he hasn't done before. He is going to stand up for to read. To read what? To read the Bible. Okay, let's see what happens here. So he gets in verse number 17. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. He didn't ask for it. It was just, that's the next thing to read. Okay, so he's going to hand him the book Isaiah. And he's going to read from Isaiah. And so here we go. I'm going to give the book to, uh, to Mr. Moy. Mr. Moy, here's, here's your book. Here's your book. Okay, right there. Here's the book. And they're going to give it to Jesus. And Jesus stands up and he starts reading. Don't worry, I'll make you read. Don't worry. Look at what he says here. The verse number, he, he begins to write, write it, read at this place. He found the place where it was written, verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. And gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. <laughs> you know, can you imagine that moment? Everybody cut their, their mouth up and like, 
okay. Now, if he had been reading and preaching and been part of this whole thing for the last 18 years, I don't think they'd be too shocked. Like, here we go. Yeah, he's, he's really good. Wait till yeah, he's been good since he was a kid. Like, this, you guys will care. Here we go. Oh, that, that, but that wasn't their attitude. In fact, if you look at the next verse, it says, verse number 21, and he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, hey, Jaden, is not this Joseph's son? What does that mean? They, they, they weren't expecting that. Is, wait, isn't that the same guy? Isn't that, isn't that the carpenter's son, Joseph? Isn't that his son? Okay, so you have people that had been in the same synagogue with him Sabbath day after Sabbath day after Sabbath day after Sabbath day after Sabbath day. They had been there watching this young boy grow <coughs> as other men older than him would read every week, read. And there was Jesus sitting there quietly listening. And then one day he shows back up. Hadn't been there in a while. He shows back up and they bring him the book and he reads. And now here he goes and he reads this amazing passage and he closes the book right in the middle of the passage. And, he's, and then they all look at him and there's like, and then he says, this is being fulfilled right now, right now. They're like, what, you, what they did not do is like, yeah, we've been waiting for this. We've been waiting for this. We, I knew it. I knew it when you were like 15. I knew it that one time you got to preach. I knew, that's not what they did. Remember last Sunday night? If you were, here, if you were not here last night, you missed an incredible blessing. Brother, Brother Joe Motes got up and preached an amazing sermon. That was, he has a gift, doesn't he not? I almost resigned that night. Just, Get him up here. Amen. We don't need me anymore. I'd rather sit where you're sitting and listen to that every single week. Jesus, when he was Joe Motes' age, could out-preach Joe Motes in a second. But he didn't. He had another eight years or so before he would stand up, read a passage of Scripture, and say, this day is fulfilled in your ears. And all the people were like, all those men in that room were like, isn't that the same kid we saw before? In other words, they had been with him for 30 years and none of them had said, I think that might be the Messiah. They'd never done that. I got a question for you. Why do you think that that man for the last 30 years had not just been man? He had been the creator of the entire. Why do you think that? Let me tell you why I believe that. I'm going to begin reading some scriptures. These are deep scriptures, but they're great scriptures. If you want to follow along, you can try to go as fast as you can. I'm not going to have time to, to wait for everybody. John chapter 1, verse number 1, it says this. If you've memorized it, you can help me with some words. In the beginning was the, what's the next word? Word. And the what was with God and the was God. Now that's strange. Uh, let me say, let me say I'm just, I'm just going to bled out there. I do not understand how the word can be with God and at the same time be God. I don't get it. So what I don't do is to say, well, if this intellect doesn't understand it, I throw it out. That would be dumb. Because we have got people in this room right now with high level degrees who could tell me all sorts of things that I won't get? And you know what I don't do? I don't throw them out. If I did, I would never have finished Algebra 1. Because they said a negative times a negative is a, that makes no sense, guys. Just stay right now. No sense. You know what I do when I see that in my Bible? I say, wow. So the Bible just told us the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. He created everything. Now, let me go back real quick. We just talked about the beginning of the Bible a few weeks ago. And the first verse in the Bible says, in the beginning, who created everything? 
God. He created the heaven and the earth. You remember that? You remember that? He made it. God made it. Well, no, wait. This verse just said this. The word was God. And then it says all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. The Bible says that God breathed into the nostrils of man and he became a living soul. But what this verse is going to say is that in the word, in him was life. And that life was the light of men. That verse is saying something. That verse is saying that whatever this word, capital W, word is, he's God and he made everything and he has life. He is life. From him comes life. Who is this word? Well, the Bible then says this. A messenger came to prepare his way named John. And when he became to prepare the way of, for, for this word to come in. The Bible says this about that word. It says that his came, he came unto his own. His own people. The people that he claimed as his. He adopted a people group saying, you're going to be mine now. And when he came unto his own, his own received him not. But then it says this, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name. For every person to this moment who believes in Jesus as their Lord, as their God, as their maker, when they accept him as their Messiah, they get to become sons of God. See, well, how much does that cost me? What do I got to do for this? Believe in his name. And then he goes on to say this. It says, which were born, these people, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. I became his son, not because my dad's 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 dad, dad was Isaac, whose father was Abraham. Nope, no. Not because a mother and father decided to get married and have children. No. I became a son of God because God, in his own will, decided to make me his son. When I believed on him. And then it says this. And the word was made flesh. That's mind-boggling. Jaden, touch my flesh. Do I have flesh somewhere? Touch some. You just, you just touch my flesh. I'm flesh. I got blood. I'm going to show you. I got blood. I'm flesh and blood. You know that word became flesh? And the Bible says that that word dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the father. He was the only begotten of the father. Full of grace and truth. The Bible just claimed. That the word, the eternal word, the creator of the world, the one in whom life is, the one who is light, he came down and became a flesh body. He became someone that had kidneys, someone that had lungs, someone that had muscles, someone that had joints, someone that had toes, someone that had fingernails, someone who had hair, someone that had teeth, someone who could breathe, someone who actually lived on this planet and dwelt among us. And he was God. Whew. Bible explains it this way. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. God the Father created a body for God the Son. The Bible says this. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, ab abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. If you're not careful, you're going to get into some literature. You're going to get into some YouTube videos. You're going to get into some group, some thinking group, some people who are smart, some college class. And they are going to ruin you with philosophy. They're going to ruin you with vain deceit. They're going to ruin you with the traditions of men and with the rudiments of this world and not after Christ. He says, beware. For in him, Christ Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In his body is all, not half of it, not a third of it, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He is God, not half God. 
not 10% God, not one third God. He is all of God in that body. When you see him, you're seeing God. One time his, his disciples said, just do us one thing and it suffices with us. What would that be? Show us the Father. And he said, how, you've been with you how long? And you don't realize, if you've seen me, you have seen Father. I believe that. The Bible says this about your Savior. The Bible says, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. I get to be adopted as a son of God because he, at the right time, you say, well, pastor, why did he wait 4,000 years? Because it wasn't the right time yet. Why did he do it after 4,000? Because it was the right time. When the fullness of the time was come, he sent forth his son made of a woman. Okay, okay, here we go, here we go. Why is Jesus called the son of God? Why? In, in, in heaven, do you, do you think that there was, there was the, the, this, this uh, father and son? How did that work before this? But you don't see that in the Old Testament. All these things about his son and God talking about his son. You don't see that. How did this happen? The Bible has the answer to that. If you go to Luke chapter number one, you'll see it with me. And this is one verse I would encourage you to go look at because it will help you understand this a little bit better. I want you to see why he's called the son of God. Why do we call him the son of God? And, and why do we not have this, this, this uh, vernacular back in the Old Testament? Why, why wasn't that there yet? Now, it's going to say back in the Old Testament with the prophets, he's going to say, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father. Why is he called the Son of God then? Well, you see it here. Luke, Luke chapter number one. Yeah, the angel's talking to Mary in verse 30. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the, the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And, his, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, oh, How shall these things be? Saying, I know not a man. I don't have a husband. How could this be impossible? And you know, what Jesus, you know what the angel told her? The angel said this. The angel answered her and said, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. This is important. Here we go. This is the answer. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. You're not going to be with a man. It's not going to be a physical man. It's not going to be a man. Mary, you're going to have the Holy Ghost come upon you and the power of the highest, that's God, shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also, that holy thing shall be born of thee. I'm sorry, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called, what? The capital S, capital G, the Son of God. Therefore, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So it's very simple. It's, it's, it's simple. In a, few, in a few weeks, while, while we're in Mexico, we're going to have my father come here. Now, here's how it works. 45 years ago, almost 46, oh Lord, a long time ago, back in the 1970s, my mom and dad got married. And then a year later, I got a, a big sister, but there was no me yet. My parents were very dissatisfied. No, I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. But then, Father's Day, 1978, my father got the most amazing Father's Day gift ever. It was rough on my mom, though. She delivered a baby boy. My mom and my dad had made a baby boy. The man who was involved in that, therefore, is my father. So from that time on, I have been the son of Arthur Miracle. Isn't that neat? Now you have Jesus. You have Mary. She had never been with Joseph or any other man. And she has a baby. If you come out of somebody's womb, that's your mom. Who's the daddy? There was no Arthur Miracle 
or Joseph or any other man involved. Certainly not some Roman soldier. So who was it then? But she's like, this ain't going to happen, sir. I don't have any, I don't have a husband yet. I don't know a man. And he said, the Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. And the power of the highest is going to overshadow you. Therefore, that holy thing, which I'll be born of thee, shall be called the Son of God. It's simple. Who's your father? Well, my mother was empowered by the Holy Ghost. And I came. So God is my father. That makes me the son of God. That's simple. And all the fullness of the Godhead was in that child. All the way up to the day when he died on that cross for my sins as God. And all the way until he rose again. Boy, listen up. When he rose again from the dead, he was still God. And when he ascended up to heaven, he's God. And as he sits right now, waiting to come back to claim his bride, the local church, he's God. He's God. Glory to God. But I'm going to tell you something now. Okay, now listen carefully. Listen. Remember how Jesus read a scripture? Remember the scripture? Let me tell you something. Jesus did not finish the quote. He stopped before he finished the quote. Let me read to you back in the Old Testament, Isaiah 61. It says this. This is the actual passage Jesus read. You'll recognize it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that were bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. He hadn't finished yet. Because when he came the first time, that was the extent of his mission the first time. He's coming back. And he's going to finish his mission. Do you know what his mission is? Let me tell you what his mission is. His mission is what we talked about last week. Remember that word judgment? You cannot have judgment without a judge. And let me tell you what he's going to do. Let me finish the quote for you. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. He's coming back. My, my Lord and Savior is the same. Boy, look, listen to me, bud. Those boys played foursquare with Jesus and had no idea he was God. And they waited when he was 22 and he graduated from college. He still had not shown them he's God. As far as I knew, he's just an amazing 4.0 student or 4.5, whatever you got. Just never missed a thing in school, imagine, imagine, imagine. You know? If he ever cheated, it would be impossible, right? So he got all grades. But he ever got something wrong, that'd be kind of lying that he didn't know the answer. Hmm, think about that. So he, he finished. They still don't know who he is. Did you know that when he actually was there the day before he started preaching, he was already God, but nobody knew it. His friends didn't know it. The people who grew up with didn't know it. The men he had been around every week of his life didn't know it. His own mother still was trying to ponder these things, trying to figure them out in her own mind. And he was God the whole time. And let me say right now, he has not finished his mission yet. The next step is judgment. That's why the Bible tells us this. The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not Robert to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and became excuse me, and being found in, I'm sorry, and made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, here's what's gonna happen, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. One more passage of scripture to you, and we're going to pray. 
Let me give you this passage. It's in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4, the end of, of Paul, the apostle's life. Let me read this to you because this is going to change everything if you don't already know it. That means this, Jesus, the, the meek, the lowly, the bearer of burdens, he has one more mission to fulfill. And that mission is going to be as the judge of the entire world, not just those who are still living because back, but also of the dead who had died before he came back. He's, moi, 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 hold on, buddy. No, just finish. You, you can hold it right there. Just do it right there for me, buddy. Here's what the Bible says in verse number one. It says, 2 Timothy 4, 2 Timothy 4. Listen, listen, Brandon, listen. I charge thee therefore before God. He's, this, is, this is Paul talking to young Timothy. And the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick, that means those who are still living, and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. And because of that, he says this. Now, this is what I'm going to tell you this morning. For those of us who claim to believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, let me then give you, because you are going to stand before him one day. You're going to be before him and give an account of how you spent your days on this earth since the day he saved your soul. And here's the Bible says, because of that, preach the word, T Timothy. Be instant, instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their hearts from the truth and shall be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions and do the work of, evangel of, an, ev of, an, ev of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry for I am now ready to be offered. What does that mean? I'm ready to be offered. Paul says, I'm old, I'm about to die. I'm ready to go to heaven. I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. He can tell by his ticket. He's about to have his head cut off. It's coming, guys. I'm about to be executed very shortly. I'm writing this last letter to you. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. And then he says this. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only but unto all them that look for his appearing. This morning, are you looking for that appearing? He's coming back. I believe Jesus is the son of God. I believe that he has all the fullness of the Godhead in him bodily. I believe that he's going to come back. And I believe that you and I are going to stand before him. And this morning, let me say that if you have never received him as your savior, you will be held responsible because it's your job to go seek your creator. And if you seek him, the more you seek him, the more you'll discover it is the word, his son, Jesus Christ, who has life and wants to give you life and that more abundantly. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, I, I appreciate.